Hello. How's everybody doing out there? Welcome. It is uh, bon dia, as they say. It's excellent to be back here in Porto at NDC Porto. And uh, I'm Dylan, and I'm going to talk to you about email for an hour. And you're all here, so I'm assuming that lots of you either think that's a good idea or you're like, I can't wait to see what this guy's going to come out with next. And uh, we're going to kind of usurp the trope of the conference talk here. We're not going to do the live demo at the end. We're going to do the live demo right at the beginning, and it is an interactive live demo. So what I'd like all of you to do is get your phones out. Get that. Now, this is very important. You are about to see a button that says, do not push this button yet. As Eli said in their talk this morning, if you put a sign up saying, do not dig here, you know what human beings do? They get a spade and they say, please do not push the button yet that says, do not push the button yet. Because while all of you are getting that lined up and following the instructions on your screens, I'm going to switch over here to our live status page. That's looking pretty good. And yes, somebody can read instructions. Somebody else can read instructions. What does it say on the web page? It says, stand up. I mean, this is a very good sign. None of those have changed color yet. So the brown one there, that's somebody who's using a fake domain. Don't game the system, or you get me in trouble with the people who I pay to send the emails for me. The yellow one there is somebody who's already pressed the button. We don't know who you are, but I can find out. So we'll give it another moment or so. We'll give folks time to uh, get connected and uh, get their address in there. And yeah, some people are getting very excited. Like, I have to push the button. I can't not push the button. Don't put an unpushed button in my line of sight. I must push it. That looks to me like a statistically valid sampling. So are we ready? Are you ready to push the button? Three, two, one, push the button. Whee, look at that. And when you push the button, we're going to send you an email. So go and check your email. And in the email, there will be some further instructions. And the ones that are starting to go green there, those are the people who found that in their inbox. We may have a couple starting to go pink any second. If any of them go pink, it means that it's gone to your junk mail. Now, we got quite a few on there that are still yellow. We got quite a few people who are still standing up. And uh, all you folks who are still on your feet out there, you're probably thinking, this is getting a little uncomfortable. Everybody else is sitting down. Where's my email? Now, the world that we live in, it kind of runs on email, right? Email's important. I went to open Photoshop this morning, and it said, oh, yeah, you need to confirm your identity before you can run the software you paid for. We're sending you an email. And the expectation is that email is instantaneous, right? Now, all you folks who are still on your feet, remember who you are. OK, you can sit down now. That's fine. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Email, we expect to be instant. We use it for all kinds of important things. You need to sign into Azure to fix a bug in production. Oh, yeah, we just need to check your identity. We'll send you an email. And all you folks who are still on your feet there, you're thinking, this has gone wrong. This is uncomfortable. This is like too long to have to wait. But this is RFC 5321, 5321, October 2008. This is the latest version of the specification that governs how internet email behaves. And it says at the top that if it doesn't work straight away, you should wait at least 30 minutes before you try again. And that you should try for four or five days before you give up trying to send an email. So you try it, it doesn't work, yeah, come back in half an hour. And you're sitting there going at that, and your boss is like, I thought you were fixing that production problem. And you're like, no, no, boss, Azure is sending me an email so I can sign in. It, it'll take four to five days. I'm just going to goof off and play a little bit of Half-Life while it's coming through. Now, the good news is all of you who did not get that email, you can come and get one of these. I got some of these on the stage at the end. This is the sticker that should have been an email. You've seen the meeting that could have been an email? Well, now we have sticker equivalents of that. So you can come and grab one of those. Actually, we've got plenty. You can all come and grab one of those at the end. But we're going to talk about this whole kind of, how did we end up in this situation where the spec says it can take five days, but we all assume it's going to take like three or four seconds for email to get through? And how do we as developers and engineers, how do we build software that works reliably in a world where those are the rules? Now, my background in this area, um, I started building web apps. I built my first web page in about 1992. I'm an internet dinosaur. And uh, in 2002, 
I built an application. This is back when the internet had a connection wizard, because it wasn't switched on all the time. You had to plug your dial-up modem in. And uh, one of the clients that I worked with when I came out of university was this company, Spotlight. And uh, Spotlight is a job information service for professional actors. And I built them a system that sent notices about auditions and plays and movies that were looking for actors, and it did it by email. In 2002, it replaced fax machines. This was a pretty neat idea at the time. Now, this was built in classic ASP. I had a little loop that would send each email, and when it sent one, it would response.write dot, 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 and then when it got to the end, it would redirect you to a page that said it's all done. It was very rudimentary, but it worked. It had a kind of immediacy to it, and it was incredibly successful. Now, by the time I left Spotlight, I was there for about 15 years, so I built this 2002. I left in 2018. I joined their team. I moved up there. I built the team. I built successive versions of this software, upgraded it from classic ASP to .NET to um, ASP.NET MVC and microservices, all this kind of stuff. By the time I left, they were sending about a quarter of a million emails a day. And this is not sending the same email 250,000 times. This is that many jobs times that many parts in films and stuff times that many personalizations for 50,000 paying customers. And it wasn't evenly distributed either, because there was this interesting phenomenon in the way that the showbiz working day worked. We were based in London in the UK. Now, in London, in show business, nobody does any work in the morning. They stagger into work with a stinking hangover. They sit and drink coffee until it's time to go for lunch. They go to lunch. Then they get back to their desks about 2 PM. They're like, oh, I should probably do some work today. And so they start sending out all the casting notices for all the stuff they've got coming up. At the same time, as everybody in New York and Broadway and the New York television scene, they kind of finish their first latte of the morning. They're like, right, let's get some stuff out there. At the same time as Los Angeles and Hollywood finish their power breakfast and start yelling at their assistants to get their breakdowns out. So we had this massive volume of email going through the system concentrated in about a three-hour chunk every afternoon. So we're sending about 50,000 emails an hour. That's about 10 emails per second for three hours every weekday afternoon for upwards of a decade. And when I left, all this stuff was still going on. Now, you probably have an idea in your head. What do you think a professional actor looks like? Some of them look like this. A very few of them look like this. These are the successful ones. The average professional actor looks like this because they don't have a job right now. Because being a professional actor means you spend 11 months out of 12 chasing your next audition and hoping that you get the part. And so you sit at home, and you drink tea, and you push refresh on your email every 15 seconds because you have nothing better to do. And if the emails stop coming through, you phone us. And you're like, I haven't had any email for 20 minutes. Is everything all right? And of course, the truthful answer is, yes, everything's fine. Just nobody wants to hire you. Go away. But you can't say that to your paying customers because you love them, and you want them to be happy and keep giving you their money. And so we engineered a system. Like, if you said there's no email coming through, we needed to be able, anyone on you know, help desk, customer service in that company, were like, what's your email address? Yes, bang, click this, click that. Yes, according to Demon Internet, you went over quota at 11.15 last night. You have too much email. Go and delete some. So we had to build that level of visibility around all the reasons why email might have stopped working in the night. Now, because I'm an idiot, the whole time that I'm doing this for money, I'm also running my own email server for fun. I ran a what's called a Qmail box. A Qmail is an open source mail relay that runs on Linux and Unix. And I ran a Qmail system which hosted all my email and about a dozen of my friends for 15 years. Ran all my own email on premise on a, an old Hewlett Packard workstation. I eventually stopped doing that. And you will find out why over the course of this talk. And then the third kind of uh, point, I guess, in, in favor of my credibility as to why I can stand up here and talk to all of you about how to work with email is uh, some of you got an email recently that looked like this. And I know you did, because if you didn't, you wouldn't have been able to get into the building. So all the people who didn't get it, they're outside. We don't need to worry about them. 
But I built the system that sends these emails. I built the ticket platform that NDC is using to run, run NDC Porto. And when we were kind of bootstrapping the system last year and setting it up for London, there were all kinds of weird quirks with companies where like, the company employed another company to run their email, and that company employed another company to do their junk mail filtering, and that company decided that NDC conferences was sending spam. And we're like, we're not sending spam. People have paid lots of money. This is a conference ticket. It's expensive. Um, and so we had to go through all the motions. What do you need to do to get all of that as bulletproof as you can possibly get it? So that's what the kind of experience that I'm bringing to this talk. Now, we're going to start at the beginning. This is 1961. It's a computer called the Compatible Time Sharing System. Now, email is older than networks. The CTSS didn't connect to any other computers. It was a massive like, bank of disk drives the size of refrigerators, well, tape drives the size of refrigerators, um, in a, a university in uh, California somewhere, I think. Don't correct me, YouTube. I think it was California, but you could look it up. And uh, you could leave messages for the other users on this computer. So you could send mail. But you weren't actually sending it, because it didn't go anywhere. It just got stored on tape. And when your colleagues came in the next day and they logged in, they would see the messages you left for them. So this was like leaving post-its on a really expensive refrigerator. This was the first system that allowed you to send messages to other people. Like I said, there was no networks involved. It was just one single system. Now, we're going to jump forward about eight years to 1969. Because if the United States of America was a television program, 1969 would have been a season finale where they pull out all the stops. Because America did so much cool stuff in 1969. They walked on the moon. That was pretty awesome. It was the year that the Boeing 747 flew for the first time. It was the year that the Lockheed supersonic spy plane, the SR-71, flew for the first time. It was the year of Woodstock, kind of rounded out. So apparently, it wasn't the summer of love. That was 1967. Old people on the internet have complained at me about that one. But Woodstock was 69. And so you had this massive kind of engineering and culture and counterculture and this uh, huge sort of celebration, all this stuff going on. And it was the year that they kind of invented the internet. Because this, the ARPA network, Advanced Research Projects Agency, December 1969. Now, prior to this point, there were some computers that talked to each other. By just, I would, my computer would dial your computer, and we'd exchange data. But this was the first thing. When people talk, talk about connecting to the network, this the network, it's the network. This was the thing they were talking about. And ARPANET started in 1969, and uh, it had four nodes. And the big revolution of ARPANET was any computer on that network could talk to any other computer on that network. And as soon as this came along, people went, well, if the computers can talk to each other, maybe the humans can also use them to send messages to each other. Now, internet email is a culmination of probably hundreds of people contributing ideas and specifications and code over decades of, uh, decades of work. It wasn't invented by one person. But one of the, I think, the most influential contributors to it was this guy. It was Ray Tomlinson, and he, uh, in the early 70s, was working on one of the first systems for sending email over the ARPANET. And Ray Tomlinson is the person who decided to use at in email addresses. Now, early email addresses look like this. There's no .com or .net or .pt or .edu on there. It's just Alice at MIT Multics, because it's your user, at your host name. We didn't have things like .com yet, because we didn't need them. Because in 1972, if you were connected to the ARPANET, you wanted to put a new machine on, you'd get it out of the box, you'd plug it in, you'd switch it on, and then you'd talk to Jake. Elizabeth Feinler, uh, apparently when she was a kid, uh, <laughs> there's something about her little sister called her Baby Jake instead of Baby Jane. And the name stuck, and she was known as Jake for her uh, entire life. And uh, she ran the Network Information Center at Stanford University, or Stanford Research Institute, from 1972 to 1988. And Jake and her team maintained the hosts file. We've all got hosts files. There's one on your phone, there's one on your laptop, and sometimes if you're having a really bad day, you need to edit it. But the host file used to be a file. It was a text file that would get copied around the net on paper tape or using FTP and these kinds of things. And it was a list of every computer on the network, along with all the contact details of the person who looked after it, street address, their real name, their telephone number, and their email address. Now, when technological innovation comes around, there are kind of two sorts of people in the world. There are the people who look at it and go, that would be really cool and useful, and it's going to make my life easy. And there are people who look at it and go, that would be really cool and useful, and I bet I can use it to get rich. This is Gary Turk. Now, <laughs> 
Gary Turk is one of those people who's this kind of really significant figure in the history of computing. But uh, kind of the thing he did, he was young enough when he did it that if you type his name into Google, the top match is his LinkedIn, because he's still out there and he's still working on stuff. And uh, Gary was the inventor. He says in his profile he's the father of e-marketing. Now, Gary worked for a company called DEC, the Digital Equipment Corporation, 1978, and they've just launched this thing. This is the DEC System 20. It's one of the first computers that had ARPANET protocols built into it. And being a sales engineer at DEC, he kind of figured, well, we should let people know. People on the ARPANET are going to want to know about our computer that does ARPANET stuff. And uh, DEC had a big thing on the US East Coast. They had a lot of offices. They were very well known in New York and Boston, but the West Coast, not so much. And so he he paid somebody to go through the host's file and type in all the email addresses of everybody on the internet, on the West Coast. You know, let's not be, be silly here. And uh, he sent an email to all of them. And uh, the email looked like this. Now, about a third of the way down, he overflowed the address buffer that email supported. And so all the people who received this got an email that started with 200 lines of other people's email addresses. And then right at the end, it had this little bit going, we invite you to come and see the DEX system 2020. Now, this is generally regarded as the first spam ever sent. May 1978, that's when spam started. Now, the ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, was funded by the United States Department of Defense. Has any of you ever got in trouble at work and like your boss maybe shouted at you a little bit? I mean, I have. You ever gotten enough trouble that uh, the police shouted at your boss? Have you ever screwed up so badly that the United States Air Force yelled at the person who owns your company? Because that's what happened to Gary Turk, is Major Raymond Chahor from the United States Air Force got in touch with his boss at DEC and said, you do not do this shit on a defense network. Do you hear me? This is not for marketing. Now, there's a tiny window there where maybe we could have fixed some of this stuff. But the problem was that all the people who used email in the 1970s, they were hippies and libertarians. And they went, well, obviously, we can trust people to behave. So they just went, yeah, pinky promise. We won't send junk email ever again. It's fine. We're very sorry, and we won't do it anymore. Now, our timeline from this point forward, you know they have these kind of demographics. Like there was the baby boomers, and then there was Generation X. And then there are the millennials, and then there's Generation Z, and then there's Generation Alpha. And there's this little weird gap in the middle of people who were not quite sure what those people are. You know, what do we call them when we do these, these population demographic studies? Now, the definition that I subscribe to is that Generation X is the people who were born before Star Wars. If you were born before Star Wars came out, you are Generation X. And if you were born after Return of the Jedi, you are a millennial. Star Wars, 1977, Return of the Jedi, 1983. The people in the middle, we are the Millennial Falcons. We are the micro-generation. And the greatest Millennial Falcon of them all is the internet as we know it. Because when Star Wars came out in 1977, the ARPANET used the NCP, Network Communication Protocol. TCP IP didn't exist yet. Everything was done using the host's file. Junk mail had not been invented yet. This had never happened. Skip six years forward. By the time Return of the Jedi comes out, the internet is called the internet. TCP IP is a published standard, and most people have started embracing it on their systems. January 1st, 1983 is when TCP IP rolled out. DNS is becoming widespread. The standards are published. It's being adopted. It's replacing host's file. And as we've just seen, junk mail has been very much invented. And one of the th other things that was invented in that window was SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. It was invented by this guy, John Postel. And the thing about SMTP, it's a, proprietor, it's a, a protocol that was documented in 1982. It was incredibly successful. And the problem with successful technology is once you've got a lot of people using your stuff, you kind of get stuck with it. Like, we could build, I'm sure most of us in this room, we could build an amazing email system right now that solved all the technological problems of SMTP and internet mail. But it would be useless because we'd have to persuade everyone else to use it. And they're not going to because they don't want our system because their system works with your system. And your system talks to your system. And your system talks to Yahoo and Amazon and Microsoft and the people who you pay your bills to and all this kind of stuff. 
So SMTP kind of got, we got stuck with it. The thing that came out in 1982 was so successful that today, in 2023, 41 years later, we still have email systems that can communicate with that. In terms of reverse compatibility, imagine you went out, you bought an M2 silicon MacBook, and it came with a tape drive so that you could load your PowerPoint slides off a data cassette. That's the kind of backwards compatibility that we're talking about here. Now, one of the things that was published in 1982 was the format of an email address. What is and is not valid? Uh, how many of you folks out there have written code to validate an email address? Did you use a regular expression? Yeah, we've, we've all been there, right? Did it work? <laughs> Sometimes. Now, let's take a look at some sample data. So let, let's say uh, we're, we're going to bring in the Avengers here, because this sounds like a job for the Avengers, right? And uh, we've got the, the Avengers email addresses here that I found in one of Troy Hunt's data breaches. So uh, Iron Man is, is iron.man at avengers.com. Valid email address? Yeah, 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 we, we think. Does anyone think it's not? I mean, you're not going to admit it in front of this crowd, but how about spider-man at avengers.com? We good with that? How about T'Challa with the apostrophe in it? I see some shaking heads. How about rocket plus Groot at avengers.com? Yeah, I see nodding. What about Bruce the Hulk banner at avengers.com? How about Vision? So Vision is, doesn't care about all of that human-readable DNS crap. Vision is an IPv6 address literal expressed in hexadecimal. I have disturbing news for you, friends. These are all valid. Every single one of these is a valid email address according to the specifications that govern internet email. So maybe validity is not really the right question. Maybe we shouldn't be asking, is the email address valid or not? Because really, that's not going to get us very far. Now, an email address consists of two parts. There is a domain part, and this controls where is this email going. And there is a local part, and that controls what happens when it gets there. So the way that email kind of works is uh, you can speak email using Telnet from a, a command prompt on Windows. I can go onto my laptop, I can open the C drive, I can type in NSLOOKUP, and it'll go, hey, here's your DNS server. And I'm like, all right, uh, set type equals MX. I want to look for MX, mail exchanger records. And I want to see what are the mail exchanger records for funwith.email. That's the domain that I set up for the purpose of this talk. And it's going to come back, OK, here you go. Mail exchanger, SMTP1, SMTP2. There is a number in there called preference. Some people call that priority. Now, priority is a stupid name for it, because when we talk, which number is higher, 10 or 20? 20 is higher than 10, right? Can we at least agree on that? But a server with priority 10 is a higher priority than a server with priority 20. So we call it preference. If anyone calls it priority, they are wrong, and they are probably confused. So that says, look, try this one. And if you can't get to that one, you try this one. And if you can't get to either of them, go away for half an hour and keep trying for four or five days. We've already seen that part right. Now, I can then tell that into that mail relay. And I can say, it says, hello, nice to see you. And I can say, hello, I'm DylanBT.net. And it says, OK, I'm SMTP fun with email. I say, I have mail from Dylan at DylanBT.net. And it says, OK. And I say, recipient to hello at fun with email. And this point is where the server on the other side decides, am I going to let you get away with this or not? And uh, as we've seen, validity based on specifications isn't going to get us very far. I wanted to do some research. So I went on Google, and I looked up what are the best email providers for doing stupid experiments. And then I went, no, no, scrap that, scrap that, scrap that. Let's uh, best business email posting. What are the companies out there that you should trust to run your mail if you're doing something important with email? And uh, I found some wonderful resources. I found uh, this article on PC Magazine. The best hosted email providers in 2020 are Salesforce, uh, GoDaddy, which is best for Microsoft Office 360 users. Uh, Zoho Mail is good for Zoho loyalists. We could probably have figured that out. And apparently, the best email system for Microsoft organizations is Teams. Now, in case you're not familiar with the landscape of corporate email, this is like you went on to Car Magazine, and you said, what are the best economy family cars for 2020? And it went, was the Hyundai Tucson, and there's bicycles, and there's Francesinha, and there's Penguin. And you're like, only one of the, uh, yeah, 
but I also found some articles written by serious journalists who are good at their jobs, which recommended all kinds of things, and I kind of looked at a bunch of these, and I narrowed it down to a choice of five. Now, disclaimer here, I am going to show you a bunch of stuff that I did with corporate email providers. These are serious companies out there that every single one of them is a really good, rock-solid product. The sensible things that normal people do all worked brilliantly on every one of these platforms. This, what I'm doing is the equivalent of, let's test a bunch of cars. We're going to fill the car with gravel. We're going to set it on fire. And we're going to drive it across a bridge. And we're going to see, does it blow up before it sinks? It's destruction testing. I don't want anyone going away from this talk and going, oh, well, we shouldn't use Zoho Mail, because in Dylan's talk, you couldn't do that. That is not what this is about. We clear? So what I did is I took Office 365, Google Workspace, the people who run Gmail, um, Zoho Mail, Proton Mail, and Fast Mail. Now, I didn't tell any of them I was doing this. I just went on and set up accounts as a regular, ordinary paying customer. And then I registered subdomains for every single one of those providers so I can set up all the DNS and everything to route email to all of those different providers. Then I went on to all of them. I was like, right, what mailboxes will these things let me create? So T'Challa, with the little apostrophe in the email address there. Can I create T'Challa at fun with email? Google says yes. Absolutely fine. Office says yes. Zoho Mail, put in T'Challa, I click Add. Yep, it kind of looks like it's worked, but then when I click Update, I get error, sending response, expected thing at line 40. So their back end supports it, but I'm guessing the people who wrote their front end weren't expecting an email address with a quote in it, and it's breaking the JSON. Meh, big deal. We're going to give that a frowny face. Proton Mail, T'Challa, save address. Nope, not allowed. You can't have that. OK, so no for that one. And Fast Mail, T'Challa, it says, please check this. All right. Let's try Rocket plus Groot. Now, this is where we get into something interesting. This is where we get into the difference between addresses and mailboxes and delivery and routing. Because I can go onto Gmail, and I can put in Rocket plus Groot. It says, email cannot contain special characters. But you can absolutely send mail with a plus in it to a Gmail-hosted account, because most of us have probably done it. Now, it turns out there is a thing called email address subaddressing. And uh, this is the standard that kind of Recommend this is not supported by everybody universally, but what it says is that you can put like address plus something, and everything before the plus that's the domain mailbox, and everything after the plus will sort that out later. So this should be deliverable. And uh, what I discovered is that over the over time, this has been embraced everywhere. Gmail supported this since 2008 is the earliest thing I could find. Um, Fastmail has supported it. Proton Mail supports it. Zoho Mail supports it. And uh, as of May 2022, Microsoft supports subaddressing as well. So as of now, you can't use plus in mailboxes, but you can use it to send mail on all of these. So when we say Rocket Plus Group, yes, it's a valid email address, but no, it's not a valid mailbox name. Now, something just interesting I want to flag out here. <coughs> plus addressing means that all of these, Iron Man plus Jarvis, Iron Man plus Thor, Iron Man plus Nick plus Fury, they will all end up going into the same mailbox. But there's something else that Google do, which is interesting, which is that Gmail addresses will ignore dots. So uh, Iron Man, Iron dot Man, I dot R dot O, Iron dot Man plus Jarvis, Iron dot Man plus Ant dot Man, all of these also go to ironman at gmail.com. Now, uh, if any of you knows a town in Australia called Kutamundra, in Kutamundra, there is a Mohood's IGA, which is like a grocery and liquor store. There is a Dylan Beatty who works there. And I know that because I get his pay slips. Because he thinks that his email address is dylanbeatty at gmail.com. And it's not, that's mine. And I would email him to tell him, but it just comes back to me like a boomerang. So if anyone's in the neighborhood of Kutamundra anytime soon, uh, go to the Morwood's IGA, ask for Dylan Beatty, just give him a little slap and ask him how he thinks the internet possibly works when some guy in London is getting all of his shifts and all of his pay slips. And that's just because of this dot thing. Google thinks they're the same address. So let's try Bruce Banner in quotes, because we can put spaces in the local part if we quote it. You can't do this on anything. Nowhere will let you create a mailbox which has a space in the mailbox address name. This is a complete non-starter here. But let's try a couple more interesting edge cases. What about uh, just quote, single quote on its own as a mailbox name? Google says, yeah, that's fine. Outlook says, yeah, that's fine. Zoho Mail says invalid username. All right, fair enough. Proton Mail says, no, we can't do that. We've already seen that. Fast mail says, please check this. All right, that one's not going to work. What about single hyphen? 
Google says email cannot be a single hyphen. Well, what about double hyphen? Yeah, it worked. So you can't be minus at, but you can be minus minus at. That's fine. Um, Outlook says, yeah, you can be hyphen at whatever you want. Um, Zoho, Proton, Fastmail says this name is already taken. <laughs> now, it's not. But OK, we can't create it. I'm going to give that a frowny face. Um, so this is a complete set of aliases that I was able to set up. The last one is just underscore at. That works on Google. It works on Office 365. Zoho Mail underscore at AS101. What is AS101? OK, let's open the Chrome Network Inspector. We'll take a look. The response that comes back looks like this. It's a JSON error message that says 200 OK. Good game, good game. I'm going to put that as a cross. And finally, fastmail underscore at. Great choice. <laughs> so there we go. That's what this whole idea of validity actually looks like, is it depends where you're getting your email from. And it depends what kind of addresses you're trying to implement. And it depends how that company is interpreting the specification. Now, the other thing that I set up is I set up what's called a catch-all address. And a catch-all just says, look, any mail that comes to this domain, it's fine. I don't care who it's addressed to. I'll take it, and then we'll figure out later. Because I was thinking maybe with a catch-all address, I could try out some of these weird esoteric edge cases. So I went onto Gmail, and I tried to send mail to quote Bruce Banner with a space in the middle. And it just said, no, you can't, you can't send mail to that. And I tried it on Proton, and it said, you can't do that either. So I started thinking. Now, we saw a moment ago. Let's just check email address validity. So this is the actual rule about whether an email address is valid or not, is does it contain at least one at sign? If it doesn't, it's not valid. If it does contain at least one at sign, it depends. There you go. That, that is official email validation. Can an email address be case sensitive? It can, if you're evil. <laughs> the bit on the right, the domain part, that's DNS, and DNS is case insensitive by design. Uppercase, lowercase, the internet doesn't care. The bit on the left absolutely can be case sensitive. Now, when SMTP rolled out in the early 80s, a lot of places that implemented it were implementing it on top of a Unix mail system that already existed. And on Unix systems, they have a case sensitive file system which means your mailbox is the same as your home directory, which is the same as your username. And your home directory is on a case-sensitive hard drive, and so it's case-sensitive. And so Alice with a little a and Alice with a big A could be different users on a Unix machine. You know, if you were evil, if you think this is a good idea, we have to have a talk. But there's nothing technically stopping you doing it. Now, generally, this isn't a problem. However, there are certain organizations, Hello Airlines, I'm looking at you, that when you put your email address in, they flip it into uppercase immediately, probably because they're still running COBOL somewhere in the background. And so if your software is converting users' email addresses from lowercase to uppercase, it is just possible that somebody out there who is technically correct is no longer going to be able to get email from you because they have implemented the specification in a way that you are ignoring. So yeah, you can have case-sensitive email. You probably shouldn't. And if you do, that's your problem. But technically, you're not breaking any rules. Let's go back to our little transcript here. Now, I've telneted in. I've said mail from. I've recipient to. And it's going to say, OK, that's cool. I know who that is. I'm going to send mail for that. And at this point, I'm going to say, here's some data. And I'm going to say, hello, dot on its own, ends the email queued as there's a message I do, boom, done. And I can go and I can open my fun with email, and there is that message. And it says, hello, and there's a message ID. There's nothing on the envelope. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it's going to. None of that stuff is included, but it got delivered. It got to where we were going. Now, at this point, I'm thinking, hang on. If I can send email by injecting stuff directly onto port 25, Maybe I can try that to send email with spaces in it. So I did an NS lookup for ProtonMail, pm.funwith, and it said mail, protonmail.ch. And I telneted into them, and I said, hello, fun with email here. I've got mail from me, and I'd like to send it to fun with email. And it goes, no protocol error. Uh -uh. Can't do that. OK, so scratch ProtonMail. Let's try another one. Let's try Zoho. So Zoho, there's their mail exchanger. We tell them into it. There's that. We say hello. We say mail from this. We say recipient to. It says relaying disallowed. Now, technically, I'm not relaying. Technically, I'm delivering. But that's tripped some bit of their validation that's looking at the wrong thing. OK, not going to work. Let's try Google. Yep, tell it into Google, port 25. Hello, mail from recipient to. Eh. 
the recipient address is not a valid RFC 5321. Now, that's lies, because it is, because I've read the spec, and that is totally valid. It's just that Google is saying it isn't. Now, I don't know who's right here, Google or the standard, because Google's got a lot more money than the standard, right? Let's try it with Microsoft. So I uh, got the, the Outlook.com mail relay. I telneted into that. Now, the interesting thing I found is that every single server that I tried this from, I got the same error saying service unavailable. This was the, uh, the, the Alphandega Wi-Fi this morning saying you can't send it through that. Every network that I tried, I could not relay email through Outlook.com. It just wouldn't let me. I couldn't find one anywhere. But I did a version of this talk in Oslo earlier this year, and I got an email afterwards from Thomas Eisenberger saying, hey, I have a machine here that uh, hasn't been blacklisted by Microsoft, so I thought I'd give it a try. And so Thomas sent me a transcript of connecting to MS Fun with email and sending that through, and there's Fun with email, and uh, there's the email address. I'd call it a success, and it queued the mail for delivery. And just as it's looking really promising, we get a non-delivery report because Microsoft, oh, yeah, we, but then afterwards we decided that we didn't want that anymore. So sad face for Microsoft. So we got one left to try. We got fast mail. Um, so I'm going to tell that into them, and I'm going to go hello fun with email mail from this recipient to fun with email at fm .fun with email. Uh, this is looking promising. This was sent to an email address with spaces in it, queued for delivery. Did it work? There it is. It worked. So fast mail. You can actually send email with spaces in the email address. And it goes, oh, yeah, that's fine. We can cope with that. Um, and you notice it's taken all the quotes off. So now you get this thing, which you're looking at. And you know, I would love to show this to help desks and go, can you tell me what happened with this email here? Because they'd be like, we don't know. And we don't want to be help desk anymore. Now, all of the stuff we've been doing there, this is kind of direct delivery. I'm finding the place that email has to go, and I'm telnetting into it, and I'm formatting the message by hand. That's not really how messaging works in real life. If we want to send a message to uh, His Excellency uh, Lazarus uh, Chakwera, who's the Prime Minister of Malawi, um, we are not going to go to Malawi and go to the top of the hill and knock on the door of the presidential palace. One, it's a long way. That's an expensive trip just to send one letter. Two, he might be out. And then we'd be like, ah, oh, we come all this way for nothing. No, if we want to send a letter like that, we put a stamp on it, and we stick it in a mailbox, and we trust the global delivery infrastructure to take care of that thing for us. Now, this works in reality because physical mail has certain built-in constraints. One of them is it costs money. Even you've got the cost of the postage. You've got to buy a postage stamp. You've got to address the thing. You've got to physically carry it to the mail. You've got to print it. Have you seen how much printer ink costs these days? If you were running some kind of a scam where you wanted to contact a million people, and if any one of them bought your product, you'd make a profit on the deal, that would have to be an unbelievably profitable product because you are going to be in the hole for a couple of hundreds of thousands of euros just from the costs of sending that many messages. So physical mail works because it has fundamental built-in constraints. Internet email does not have fundamental built-in constraints. And so if we go and take a look at what's in my mailbox today, Elisa Williams, hello, dear. I'm looking for a special friendship. And Martin Smith's web design price is number one on Google. And Mark is sending me steel products manufacturers. And the, the president is sending me cross-border international monetary fund. Uh, Kelly McGoldrick, I just want to tell you how I'm feeling. I've got Joe D -D Dillon, your subscription has been confirmed. This is crap. This is a massive, relentless fire hose of crap. Now, we have decided that this is called spam. The internet says that junk mail is called spam because of a Monty Python sketch about a bunch of Vikings singing a song in a cafe. I have never really understood why the Vikings in the cafe, but it just stuck. Spam became this term for noise that drowns out the signal in the communication medium that you're looking at. And the reason spam is such a problem is that email was invented by hippies. And hippies are like, oh, peace and love, man, and everything's fine. And for most of the history of the first part of the internet, this just kind of worked because everyone was nice. Because you know the evil people probably weren't smart enough to get online. And even if they did, there was only so much damage they could do. But then the 90s comes around. And what happened in the 90s was revolutionary because um, we had this. 
And suddenly, an entire generation of people who had never had access to any networks before started getting the web, and they started getting email. And it wasn't just that we were rolling out connections and dial-up and broadband, all these kinds of things. It's that we were giving people a set of communication paradigms that they had no frame of reference for. And so some point in the 90s, someone opens their email, and they've got a photograph of their grandchild who was born in Australia an hour ago. Now, this is too good to be true. You cannot send a color photograph from Australia to the United States in an hour, but suddenly there it is, and there they are, and look, they're so cute. This is just amazing. It's too good to be true, but there it is right before your eyes. And then the email below that one is Bill Gates saying that he's partnered with Disneyland, and everyone who forwards this email is going to get a million dollars. Well, the first one was true. Why wouldn't the second one be true as well? And so scams and spams, we had no filter for knowing what was real and what was fake and what was a scam and what wasn't. Now, the good news is that this junk email problem was completely solved by uh, the um, <laughs> Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act 2003, which was the American government going, we will make a law and that will stop spam forever. And that's why none of us has had any junk mail for the last 20 years. Turns out they missed two things. One, nobody gives a crap. And two, most people aren't in America and really couldn't give a crap. And actually, it is ridiculously easy to comply with all the conditions of the Can Spam Act by going, we are going to send unsolicited email, but here's our street address, and you can unsubscribe here, and good luck trying to prosecute us. This accomplished nothing. The second approach to dealing with unsolicited commercial email is client-side filtering. Now, most of us use this. I use this. Gmail has this. Outlook has this. I'm not going to talk about that in this talk, because it's not really any kind of technology standard as a developer that is interesting to you trying to deliver mail to your customers. They can set up their filters however they like, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so we are just going to step away from that problem. If you want to filter your email, you go for it. Your mail, your filters, your rules. We are not interested. And so that leaves us with a third option, which is can we stop the bad people getting on the internet in the first place? Because it turns out what we really needed from the hippies was we needed peace, love, and authentication. Peace and love is all very well, but we kind of like to know where it's coming from. Now, one of the big steps towards this was uh, SMTP, 1982 version, no security, no usernames, no passwords, no negotiation. Just, hey, I have mail for you. And the other system goes, yay, give me all the mail. It's fine. So we created a new version. And we didn't call it the complex mail transfer protocol, because that would have confused people. We called it extended simple, because of course we did. Now, uh, extended simple is, uh, does anyone remember this movie? Anyone know this? Or am I sure? Yeah, yeah, I got some nodding heads. Uh, Extended SMTP is based on the film Labyrinth, because there's the scene where Sarah gets in the labyrinth and she meets the worm. And uh, she says to the worm, did you say hello? And the worm says, no, I said hello, but that's close enough. Because if you want to start an extended SMTP conversation with a remote server, you tell that into their mail server, and you don't say hello, you say hello. And the server on the other end goes, oh, cool. You speak extended SMTP. All right, here's the menu. This is all the stuff I can do. I support authentication. I can do plain. I can do login. I can do cram with an MD5 checksum. I can do start TLS if you want to move this onto a secure channel. I can do enhanced status codes. And we send back, OK, cool. Let's start TLS. Let's get this on a secure channel. It says, OK, let's start again. I send hello. It says, cool. I send, hey, authentication. And I send a username and password, base64 encoded. I send that over, it goes, hey, cool. We know who you are. This is great. Now we can have a civilized, grown-up conversation. Now, this works brilliantly for sending mail via my relay. So I got my ISP. I want to send some mail. I can talk to them and go, look, it's definitely me. Could you please send this to Lazarus Traquera? Send this to Microsoft. Send this wherever it's going. In the other direction, it doesn't work so well. Because one of the reasons email is such a wonderful and powerful protocol is the ability to, I can receive mail from anyone on the planet. We've never met. We don't have any kind of agreement. I don't know who they are. But like uh, Thomas, who sent me the transcript of the Microsoft, I'd never met the guy before. He saw my talk on YouTube, and he emailed me, and I got it. And that's awesome, and that's amazing. 
But there is no system we've come up with which knows that Thomas is a good guy who's trying to help, and this person here is a weird scammer who's trying to steal my money. Now, one of the most interesting people in the history of kind of electronic freedoms and stuff is this guy, John Gilmore. And uh, John is noted for a quote he had. He said, the net interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. His theory is that if you try to restrict the flow of information on a resilient network artificially, the protocols are just going to go, well, that server isn't working. And the protocols don't care that there's a firewall or there's authentication. The protocols just go, well, that one doesn't work, so we'll go this way. We'll find another way around it. Now, John is one of those people who I agree with, like 90, I agree with 95% of what he says. And then the last 5%, I'm like, ah, did you really have to go there? Because John runs an open SMTP relay, which he refuses to switch off. And he is like you know, a flag-waving libertarian. He's like, everyone in the world has the right to send anonymous, unencrypted email. It's a fundamental part of the network. Um, this is his SMTP relay, hop.toad.com. There is not an ISP or an access point in the world that will let you talk to this. It's out there, and if you can get to it, you can use it to relay mail, but one, most things won't let you talk to it in the first place, and two, anything coming from Toad.com, most internet providers are like, we are not touching this. We, this is a hive of scum and villainy. We're not letting any of that mail in there. Um, and I really wanted to use hop.toad.com in the live demo at the start of this talk, but you try and send mail from Azure to that, and they go, no, please don't do that anymore, or we're going to switch off all your Azure. So, we need to deal with this problem. When a piece of mail arrives at our mailbox, we don't want to restrict people's ability to connect. But then when it gets there, we want something that will allow us to go, is this valid? Is this legitimate? Are we interested in taking delivery of this piece of information? Now, one approach that has been used for this is the idea of real-time databases of all the services that send spam. Now, on uh, one of my, my tools we'll see in a second, I got this breakdown. This is all the different databases. And these basically say, look, we'll keep a list of all the bad people. And if you get a piece of email, you can look in our database and see if it's from the bad people. And if it is, you can drop it. The problem with this approach is that to become one of the bad people, all you need to do is upset one person one time for one minute. And they can put you on the bad people list. And then you're like, oh, I can't send email anymore. Someone's put me on the bad people list. And then you need to remove yourself which means you need to find out which list you've made it onto. You need to go onto their website. You need to go, this is definitely me. This is my address. You need to wait 48 hours. You can only do this once a week. This is why I stopped running my own mail server, because even though I was doing everything right and had all the right DNS records and nobody else had access, I wasn't running an open relay, about once a month, I'd end up on one of these lists because somebody on an adjacent IP address was sending junk. And so they'd be like, oh, we'll, we'll block the whole, the whole IP address block. And just the time of constantly having to prove my innocence as a netizen in good standing got overwhelming. I got completely fed up with it. I decided I was going to get somebody else to do that, all that stuff for me, which is kind of a shame because it was fun. Now, if you go on to uh, the Google DNS toolbox or the Google Dig toolbox here, we're going to take a look at fun with email. Now, that currently has no records on A because it's not a website. But if we bounce across to the text records for fun with email, you can see in here we got this record here, V, S, P, F, I, P, 4, include, da, 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 da. Now, this is how we are using DNS to authenticate mail. What we're doing is we are saying, look, this domain authorizes certain people on the internet to send mail on its behalf, and nobody else is allowed to do that. Now, the format of these records here, V equals SPF1. SPF is the sender protection framework. And what I've said here is, look, IP4, this IP address is allowed to send mail for fun with email. This set of addresses, so smtp.com is one of the providers that I've um, used to send the stuff at the start of a the talk. They're good. Messagingengine.com, they're good. And anybody else, the little squiggle here means this is a soft delete. Now, the plus is a pass. That's the default and normally can be skipped. Neutral means don't care. Why would you have a rule that says you don't care? You use it for diagnostics and troubleshooting. Because you can look in the logs and see that you didn't care. And if you didn't care about the right things, it's probably safe to switch them on. And a soft fail is deliver it, but don't tag it. And you can have a hard fail. 
you can publish a rule to the whole world that says any email that claims it came from funwith.email, if it didn't come from one of these relays or one of these servers, you can just delete it and not tell anyone that it got deleted. Now, the plus is the default, so you'll normally see that get left out. So we've got this whole delivery authentication mechanism here. And all the stuff we talked about so far, so what's on the outside of the envelope? This is how does the thing get there in the first place. Let's talk about what's actually inside the thing here. So we're going to pretend uh, that uh, it's, um, it's back in 1982. I got my PDP 11 up here. And uh, I want to send an email to, uh, say, alice at gmail.com. I can send from to subject hello. This is the whole message body. Now, this stuff here, this is not routing information. This is for the human recipient on the other end. Now, this stuff has to be 7-bit ASCII because it has to be backwards compatible with a standard from 1982. So all the stuff you put in your email headers, all the stuff you put in the body of your email, plain text email, brilliant. As long as everything you have to say can be represented as a 7-bit ASCII text message, you're absolutely fine. We send this. This comes through the other end. This is a message about how email is fun. Have a lovely day now. But what, what if we want to send more? What if we want to send accented characters? What if we want to send PDFs? What if we want to send video files and animated GIFs of Rick Astley and other important information? We're going to use the MIME, Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. Now, MIME is one of those things, you've all seen it. You've probably only really seen it when it goes wrong, because when it works, it's invisible. MIME is really, really clever. What MIME exists to be able to do is we need to be able to take any arbitrary set of data and turn it into 7-bit ASCII, and then rehydrate it at the other end. So we're going to say, hey, we've got an email home. It's from fun with email. It's to Dylan BT. Here's the subject. There's the date. MIME version 1.0. Now, when they created MIME, they absolutely intended that there was going to be 1.1, 1 1.2, 2.0, 3.0. Turns out that some stuff got screwed up in the initial implementation. And so that 1.0 is actually a floating point Boolean. If it's 1.0, that's true, and anything else means it's not MIME, and nobody ever figured out how to make 1.1 or 2.0 work. So there we go. MIME version 1.0, yes. And then this, content type multipart mixed boundary equals. Now, this little string in pink here, that can be anything as long as it doesn't occur in the body of your mail message. Because what we're doing is we're using that as a delimiter. And then we're going to say, this is a multipart message in MIME format. That opens a container. Then we're going to put in a boundary. That opens another section, another container. Then inside this one, we're going to put more containers inside the outer container. So we're going to say, hey, we're having fun with email. This is our text body. We have another delimiter. We're having fun with email. This is our HTML body. We're going to close that one out. We're going to close that one out. We're going to put in another container here, and we're going to attach something. We're going to encode a, a PNG image in 7-bit ASCII, and we are going to send that base64 encoded. We get this big chunk of noise. And then at the other end, this thing is going to get reconstituted and rehydrated and turned back into attachments. And that's how email works. The stuff flowing between my server and your server is 7-bit ASCII, same as it's been since 1982. And maybe one day we'll fix that, or maybe we won't. Now, when it comes to building software that gets this stuff right, like the fun with email demo that I built at the beginning, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, as developers, you have to worry about. Because the email you're sending, you have no idea what kind of device it's going to get read on. This, you have no control over this environment. It could be via mobile phones, could be tablets, could be widescreen TVs, could be screen readers, could be any number of things. Somebody could be using VoiceOver to read their email out to them while they're driving. So there's a bunch of things that as developers we can do to make our lives easier. One of them, if we are sending rich formatted email, don't write that by hand. There are two tools out there. One is the Mailjet markup language, which has a logo. The other one is called Foundation for Email. They don't have a logo. They have a cuttlefish. But all right, it works for them. And what these things do, this is an example of some MJML markup. So it looks like HTML, but it's kind of specialist HTML. So this is nice. This is legible. We've got a head with a preview and a body and a section column image. Yep, OK, that's nice. Then when we run this through the Mailjet compiler, it turns it into this. Because this is what the email looks, the HTML looks like that works with email clients. It's tables inside tables inside tables inside tables all the way down. And if you're running Microsoft Outlook, you get another two tables for free, because that's the only way to do layout. Because the things that render HTML email, they differ so dramatically in what they will and won't do. Um, I saw a talk a while ago. Someone explained to me that Yahoo strips the head 
off any HTML email message, but it only strips the first head. So if you send an HTML document with two heads, it'll only remove the first one, and the second one will survive. And this is the kind of thing people have figured out to try and get HTML email to be delivered reliably. Now, these templating languages are completely static. They have no notion of loops or data injection or templating. So all of the, the stuff, the things you got at the start of the talk today and your tickets to MDC Porto, they were done by compiling Mailjet into Razor and then compiling Razor into HTML as a kind of two-step deployment process. If you want to see how that works, the code for the demo is up on GitHub. You can go and take a look at it. And so you've got the email working, and it works on your machine. Email is the worst thing in the world to use works on my machine as any kind of validation. You want to give yourself a couple of extra endpoints. One, if you are building any kind of web-based system that sends email, you want to put an endpoint in there that you can go into and you can, so this is the, the live NDC dashboard. I can click on one of the customer emails and I can see what it looks like. Now, the reason why that's useful as an administrator is you can see what got sent to somebody. The reason it's useful as a developer is I can refresh this page. If the email doesn't look right, reload, 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 hot reload. I don't even have to press Control R. So I can get the formatting and the layout just right by refreshing a browser instead of having to send a test message, wait five seconds for it to come through, refresh my mailbox, open it, still doesn't look right, round we go again, round we go again, round we go again. The second thing that I absolutely rely on when building HTML email is a tool called Papercut. And Papercut is a Windows application that sits in your system tray and gives you a local SMTP server. So I can send mail to localhost on port 25. So I can configure that in my application. And then every one of those that comes through, I can see the message. I can see the headers. I can see the body. I can literally pull that message apart and make sense of every single piece of it. I can see the raw message formatting. And this is another really fast feedback loop. Level three is MailTrap. MailTrap is a cloud service that you send mail to them, and they grab it, and then they expose it in their dashboard. Now, what MailTrap gives you is it gives you all the visibility you get out of something like Papercut, but also it checks your message against all of the common spam relays and stuff. So I can go on to spam analysis, and I can see on here, this message scored 0.8 out of 5 on a spam score. And it'll give me a breakdown of all the reasons why that might have happened. And you can see on here, the little number in orange there, this is when I just set up this demo, and it's given me that score because the domain was less than a month old. So all these factors come into account if you want to get your email to be deliverable. I can look at the HTML check, and it'll say, you got this thing here? That's not going to work if people are using Yahoo Mail on iPhones. This kind of visibility on it. So you've got everything right. You are a diligent, meticulous professional. You have tested your mail on Gmail and iOS Mail, Android, Outlook, Zoho, Proton, Fastmail, AOL, Yahoo. And then you get the angry message from the customer going, the email doesn't look right. And you're like, I tested it on everything. Can you send me a screenshot? And they send you a screenshot. And you're like, oh, crap, dark mode. Now, there are two things that I absolutely believe about email. One, you have the right to view your messages however you like. You can consume them on any device, in any font, in any language. Dark mode email is an eldritch horror from beyond the stars. Because there is no way of getting it right. You find any one of your friends who is a graphic designer, ask them to design you a brochure or a leaflet or an album cover or a book cover, and then say to them afterwards, oh, yeah, it might be on a black background or it might be on a white background. We don't know. The customer is going to choose later. They are going to get upset because you cannot design things if the end user can flip the color from black to white and back again. But this kind of, in a nutshell, is the whole paradox of email. You know, if you do have to do this kind of stuff, you end up with compromises. Like every image you use has to be black on white, but you also need a border so that if it comes up white on black, you can at least still see what's going on with it. And we're playing catch up. We are constantly playing catch up as developers because the thing about email is that email is a moving target. Oh, there we go. Let's get the moving target. There we go. There it is. Email is a moving target. Every time we think we got everything locked down, somebody comes out with a new standard. Somebody comes out with a new device. Somebody comes out with a new profile. Somebody comes out with something that we did not anticipate. The email address that validated yesterday, we'll skip that. The email address that was valid yesterday might not be valid today. The mail that you sent this morning, maybe you can't resend it this afternoon. You don't control this stuff. 
other people control this stuff, or maybe nobody controls this stuff. And that fundamentally is what I think is the most wonderful thing about internet email, is nobody can mess with it. It is the only system we've got. If I want to send you a message on WhatsApp, and the people who own WhatsApp decide they don't like me, no more WhatsApp for me. I'm not allowed to get on it. Same with Signal, same with Discord, same with Facebook, same with Twitter, same with all of these platforms. They are owned by people who can control communication between us. And yes, we've seen a bunch of stuff in here about junk mail and mail relay blocking and difficulties injecting stuff. But fundamentally, if I want to talk to you and both of us know how to set up a server, we can use email to communicate. And there is nothing that anybody else out there can do to interfere with that conversation. And frankly, you know, I think that is special. I think that is something wonderful. I think that is something genuinely remarkable. And my final slide in this talk is not going to come up because it just does not want to. So I'm going to end things there by saying, ooh. <laughs> what I have here, this is fun. Look, I wish I could show you what's going on on this screen here. There we go. That's the slide we are going to end on. So there we go, folks. Go out there, send email, use it. It's wonderful, it's awesome. Don't try and get rich off it because you are absolutely going to fail. Capitalism, stop trying to mess with email. It's one of the last things we've got left. Leave it alone, let us use it. And if your client insists that email has to render beautifully and precisely the same across all devices, find a new client because life is too short for that. Thank you very much, folks. Let's just have a little look at our report here and see how many emails we got through each of our providers. Oh, there we go. SendGrid did pretty well, SMTP to go. So the, the allocations on here are random. Yeah, that's nice. Anyway, any questions, folks? Marvelous, the silence of enlightenment. Everyone come down the front and grab some stickers, and thank you very much.